Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on the topic of transesophageal echo for patients with ARDS and ECLS. In the next 20 to 25 minutes, I will describe and illustrate the role of transesophageal echo in patients with ARDS and ECLS and describe the common pitfalls and challenges. I will cover three points. First, the role of TE in the diagnosis of ARDS. Then the role of TE guidance for ECMO cannulation. And then the role of TE once the patients are on ECMO. My first comment is that you don't necessarily need a transesophageal echo. You may be able to obtain the information with a transthoracic, but assuming that you've attempted a transthoracic echo and you have poor echogenicity, then you may have to perform a TE. So first, what is the role of TE for the diagnosis of ARDA? So I know I'm gonna be stating the obvious here, but it is not infrequent that despite the fact that it's part of the definition of the RDS, that will receive patients that are considered for ECMO and who have had no cardiac assessment. So this is going to be the first role of our echo to make sure that you don't have any left-sided valvular disease or significant LV dysfunction that could be explained in the hypoxemia. This was the example of a patient who was transferred for consideration of ECLS. He was known to have a bicuspid aortic valve and an endocarditis. And on his previous echoes, he was reported that he had mild aortic insufficiency. So when he was transferred, we repeated the transthoracic echo. And as you can see, the views were suboptimal, so we elected to perform a TE. So you can see that the AI that was described as being mild was in fact severe and needless to say that in that case ECMO was not the solution. So the next indication of a TE and again uh, if you can get the information with the transthoracic you may be able to not do a TE but sometimes you may have to proceed to do a TE to rule out intracardiac shunt. This was the example of a patient who was transferred to us also for uh, consideration of ECLS. And as you can see, she had a tricuspid valve endocarditis and she had a very drastic response to positive pressure. By that, I mean that every time that the PEEP was about three or four, she became profoundly hypoxemic, which made us suspect that she may have an intracardiac shunt. And that's what you can see here with the color, with a significant um, PFO there, and even more striking with the bubble study that she had. As a reminder, the incidence of PFO for patients with ARDS is about 16%, and another 26% of the patient have intrapulmonary shunt. So it's not negligible. The next indication for an echo in someone with ARDS is to assess their right ventricular function. Assuming that their RV is normal and giving them fluids without assessing the right ventricular function may be deleterious because they may have developed some acute right ventricular failure due to the high ventilatory settings, severe hypoxemia and hypercapnia. And we know that the incidence of acute RV failure in that setting is between 20 and 25%. So the last thing is that you may be wondering what if your patient is prone? As I'm sure you all know, we manage patients with ARDS with prone positioning for duration between 16 to 18 hours a day. So what if you just put your patient prone and they're unstable and you need to assess their cardiac function. Should you wait until they are put supine? Should you put them supine again? I would say it really depends on the situation. Obviously, you can always attempt to do a transthoracic, but it's usually limited to the apical window if you see anything at all. So if your patient's extremely unstable and also doesn't tolerate to be put back supine,
you may have to perform your transesophageal echo in the prone position and that's been described and it's not been shown to be more dangerous or more complicated um, in a series of cases they actually showed that the insertion of the probe was quite straightforward. This is the example of a patient who was transferred for consideration of ECMO for COVID ARDS, was transferred in the prone position. On arrival, he was quite hypoxemic, hemodynamically unstable despite administration of fluid. And my poor epicofo chamber already showed that the right ventricle was quite dilated and overloaded. But our main question was whether we should anticoagulate this patient. So we elected to perform a transesophageal echo and as you can see still a significant dilation of the right ventricle and some masses in the RV that in that context were highly suspicious to be a clot. So we started this patient on inhaled nitric and um, started him on therapeutic anticoagulation. And those RV clots are something that uh, we've seen a lot in patients with COVID ARDS. So just to summarize on this first point, echo is an integral part of the diagnosis of ARDS. You need to make sure that you rule out a left-sided disease, and it's also crucial to rule out shunt and assess RV function. And if you have to perform a TEE in the prone position, it's been shown to be actually very safe. So my next point is the role of TE guidance for ECMO cannulation. So just a reminder for those who are not familiar with ECMO, we have two main different types, venovenous ECMO, mainly for respiratory support, where you drain the blood from the venous system and you re-inject in the venous system. That assumes that your right ventricular function is good enough that it can pump the blood into the pulmonary circulation. And then you have veno-arterial ECMO, where you drain the blood from the venous system and you re-inject in the arterial system. In the sake of time, I'm only going to refer to veno-venous ECMO, because this is what we use the most for patients with ARDS. And you have, again, different types of configurations. So one where you have two cannulation sites in the femoral and the jugular. But you may also have seen some of those bicaval dual loom cannula where you have one insertion site and you have one cannula and two lumen with one port that drains from the IVC, one port that drains from the SVC, and the reinjection is in front of the tricuspid valve. And more recently, some uh, physicians have diverted the use of what's meant to be an um, RV support device um, known as Protect Duo with the drainage from the right atrium and the reinjection in the pulmonary artery bypassing the right ventricle. These are echo parameters that you want to assess before ECMO. As I mentioned before, you want to make sure that you don't have any left-sided valvular disease that are significant or any significant LV systolic dysfunction. The echo may help you choose the appropriate configuration, meaning VV ECMO versus VA ECMO. If your patients have acute RV failure in the setting of ARDS, you will place them on VV ECMO. And if you decide to go on VA ECMO, you want to make sure that you don't have any contraindication such as aortic dissection or aortic insufficiency. These are other echo parameters to be assessed before cannulation. You want to look at the anatomy of your superior and inferior vena cava. You want to look at your right atrial morphology. You want to make sure that you don't have any signs of chronic pulmonary hypertension because in that case VV ECMO may not be indicated, it may be more VA ECMO. And you want to make sure that you don't have a pericardial effusion or if you do have one, to have a baseline measurement for your pericardial effusion. You also want to make sure that you don't have any atrial septal defect and I'll show you why in a later case. So this is the example of a patient who was referred to 
for ECMO for COVID ARDS. And as you can see, there are some masses located at the junction of the SVCR junction. So we were a bit nervous to proceed with the regular femoral jugular cannulation and the patient instead got VV ECMO but with the femoral femoral cannulation. This was another patient, also COVID ARDS, who um, was referred to us for ECMO and as you can see also has some masses in his right ventricle which were clots and it's extremely important in those cases to make sure that the wires do not go into the right ventricle during cannulation and I'll show you some examples of that a bit later. When it comes to the cannulation itself you want to make sure that you have a good visualization of your IVC, of the bike cable and of the SVC. On the left hand side you can see the wire being advanced through the IVC and on the right hand side you can see the bike cable with both wires going through both vena cava so the femoral wires coming from the IVC and going all the way up to SVC and the jugular wire is coming down from the SVC through the IVC. In my opinion this is the safest position for these wires to be because even if the operator inadvertently advances the cannula too far, you are still in a vein. But if the wire has gone into the right atrium or in the right ventricle and the operator advances the cannula too far, then there's a risk of cardiac perforation. Unfortunately, the wire is not always where you want it to be. This is an example where the wire had gone through the posterior wall of the jugular vein, through the carotid artery, and was in the aorta and obviously it's very important that you pick that up before they start the dilation. So once the wires are in the appropriate position you still want to keep your eyes on these wires during the dilations and until the cannulas are fully inserted because what may happen as in this example is that when the wire is being pushed in a little bit during dilation or when they are advancing the cannula is that the wire may bend in the right atrium and eventually either coil in the right atrium or flip out of the vena cava and end up in the right atrium or in the right ventricle. This is an example where you can see the wire in the right ventricle. The fact that the wire is in the right ventricle is not so much the problem unless you have a clot and you don't want to dislodge that clot but it's mainly that if you advance the cannula and the wire is in the right ventricle you have a risk of perforating either your right atrium or your right ventricle. This was a, an example of a patient who uh, had COVID ARDS who was diagnosed with an ASD at the time of the cannulation. So as you can see, it's left to right, so that was not necessarily significant in terms of uh, worsening oxygenation. but. Initially, you could see that both wires were in the right position from both vena cava, but then during iterative dilations, you can see that the wire was bending in the right atrium and eventually flipped out of the superior vena cava. And when they wanted to reposition the guide wire, unfortunately, the guide wire kept on going through the ASD in the left atrium, so we had to guide them to make sure that the cannula was not going into the left atrium. It's uh, important to be aware that um, the cannula comes with an obturator and you see the different holes, um, but on echo you cannot discriminate the end of the cannula if the obturator is in place. So some operators will slightly withdraw the obturator as soon as they are deep enough in the vessel but you want to make sure that before you ascertain the final position of the cannula that the obturator is not in place anymore because you won't be able to know the end of the obturator from the end of the cannula. And this was an example of the cannula being advanced. In this case uh, the obturator was not on but you can see we're moving from the IVC and in the right atrium and just following the cannula up until the SVC. And that's the ultimate position of uh, the cannula.
So you can see that the drainage cannula is at the SVC RA junction and the reinjection cannula is in the SVC about 3 to 4 centimeters above the SVC RA junction. And we've changed that with our experience with COVID patients. We used to put the drainage cannula at the IVC RA junction, but I will show you a case later to explain why we put it much higher now, even though we know that we may have some degree of recirculation. When it comes to the bicable cannula, depending on the comfort of your operator and your own comfort with TE, it may be done under TE guidance only. And this is an example where you see the cannula being advanced. And in this case, it's absolutely crucial that you make sure that the wire is staying in the IVC at all times. Uh, really, it's not infrequent that you have the wire in the IVC in the right position and when they either dilate or advance the cannula, the wire flips out of the IVC and then goes into the ventricle. And if you keep on advancing the cannula while the wire is in the ventricle, unfortunately, you have a risk of um, having cardiac perforation. So uh, this is those protect duo. Um, again, drainage in the right atrium and bypassing the right ventricle and reinjecting in the pulmonary artery. They look like uh, PA catheters, only bigger. So you see the wire uh, lining along the right ventricular wall. In our center, they, use, they place them with both fluoroscopy and TE. And you will need a TE because the tip of the cannula needs to be past the pulmonary valve but only two or three centimeters and cannot be selective in one of the branches of the PA. So on 2D, it's actually very difficult to image those cannula all at once, but you can see on the top left um, the part where you have the drainage holes, and then you can see the cannula lining along the right ventricular wall, and you can see that the tip is just past the pulmonary valve, two to three centimeters. And um, with the color, you see that the blood is being injected in the main PA. So the summary on the TE guidance part, really you wanna keep your eyes on these wires at all times. Um, it seems like it's not a huge procedure and most of the time it's actually straightforward. But if you don't keep your eyes on the wires, they may be at the right position in the first place, but then with dilations um, be in the right ventricle. And if you advance the cannula while the wire is in the right ventricle, then unfortunately you may have a catastrophe. And as I say uh, to my trainees, it's better to take a couple of minutes and check that the wires are in the right position than to have a hole in the heart. So my last part uh, is the TE monitoring once the patient is on ECMO. So some situations where you may need an echo on someone who's on ECMO is um, persistent hypoxemia, despite the fact that the patient is on ECMO. Obviously, you want to rule out that this is not due to an oxygenator failure, but then it can be because you have a mismatch between your cardiac outputs and your ECMO flows, which you can assess with your echo and it can be a problem of position of the cannula and recirculation. So recirculation is the fact that the blood that you just re-injected is immediately being drained by the drainage cannula. And that can be because the cannula are too close to each other, it could also be a direction problem, um, but you may have to readjust the position of this cannula. The example of this patient um, the cannula were really close, um, so we had to pull the drainage cannula a little bit, and that was followed by a significant improvement in oxygenation. When it comes to those dual domain cannula, so you want to make sure that the direction of the reinjection is actually towards the tricuspid valve and not towards the septum. So in this case, you can see the reinjection is actually going towards the interior atrial septum and is actually not directed at all towards the tricuspid valve. So they had to turn the cannula around 
to um, allow the blood to be directed toward the tricuspid valve. This was an example of a patient who had COVID ARDS and who had a dual lumen cannula that was placed under echo guidance. And initially you could see that the direction of the flow was directed towards the, tri the tricuspid valve um, and the patient oxygenation improved as soon as we placed her on echo. But a couple of days afterwards, um, the cannula had not budged in terms of the measurements on, um, on the cannula itself, but the patient was still profoundly hypoxemic despite the fact that we were increasing the ECMO flows. So we repeated a TE and we could not see the reinjection flow in the right atrium anymore, but instead, when we advanced the probe, the reinjection flow was actually seen in the sus-hepatic vein and in the liver. And the explanation for that is the fact that initially the tip of the cannula uh, in relationship to the diaphragm was about four centimeters. But what happens usually is that as soon as the patient is on ECMO, we tend to decrease the ventilator settings so that they're not injurious anymore. And that is associated with a significant loss in lung volumes. And when that happens, the diaphragm may actually shift upwards and the relative position of the tip of the cannula and the diaphragm is significantly different to the point that the reinjection hole, which was initially in the middle of the right atrium, was now intrahepatic. And that's the reason why, as I mentioned before, we tend to put the drainage cannula much higher than what we used to do because we expect that once the patient is on ECMO, we decrease the ventilator settings, we will have a loss in lung volumes. So when the cannula is at the IVC area junction, then your diaphragm will ascend in the chest, and at the end, your cannula is only in the IVC. And as soon as the patient starts to wake up, coughs, then you lose your flows completely, but when it's a bit higher in the right atrium, you have a little bit less uh, of dropping flows when the patient is a little bit more awake. And we've not actually seen that much more recirculation, uh, at least clinically relevant in our patients since we've changed that. So again, now the drainage cannula is more at the SVCRA junction and the reinjection cannula, again, is in the SVC, but three to four centimeters above the SVC area junction. So talking about dropping flows, it can be obviously an oxygenator failure that you want to rule out. It can be hypovolemia, or it can be a problem with cannula position, thrombus or tamponade. This is an example where the cannula was stuck in the septum with dropping flows every time the patient was coughing. So it had to be repositioned. Um, in some centers, they will never advance the cannula. Uh, sometimes we do, but if you have to do so, it needs to be under echo guidance. This is an example where the cannula was advanced without any guidance. And as you can see, that cannula ended up crossing the interatrial septum and was in the left atrium. Lastly, um, tamponade is a possibility in those patients, uh, especially because they are in therapeutic anticoagulation. The main point I'm going to make on this is that obviously if you're on VV ECMO, you will have some hemodynamic compromise, but be very careful because many of the signs of uh, tamponade, the echo signs of tamponade will be missing. You may not have a pulsus paradoxus. You may not have any respiratory variations as I said before, those patients may not have any tidal volumes or negligible, something like 50 cc's. And in these cases, you will not have any respiratory variations. And depending on the location of the effusion or the clot, you may not actually have a drop in flows. Uh, on VA ECMO, it can be even trickier because you may not have any hemodynamic compromise. 
So to summarize on this point, the fact that the cannula was in the appropriate position on day one does not mean that you will not have to reassess it. And again, be very wary about ruling out tamponade on someone on acne. And this is the summary. So really, echo is an integral part of the diagnosis of ARDS. Uh, it's going to be useful to rule out shunt to assess your RV function. If you have to do a TE while the patient is prone, it's actually safe. And once the patient is on ECMO, make sure that if you are guiding a procedure, you're following the wires at any given times, and echo will be really helpful to assess causes for refractory hypoxemia and drop signals. And on this note, I thank you for your attention.